Galatians chapter 3. Um, a few years ago, I decided that I wanted to know what this Bible said about salvation. I didn't want, I wasn't interested in reading John Calvin and what he said 300 years ago. I didn't care. Uh, or anybody else for that matter. I wanted to know what God said. And I wanted to know how God said it and why God said it. And um, so what I did was I... Um, and I, I recommend doing this. You can make your own commentary if you want. You can make your own uh, study Bible if you want. And it starts with studying the Bible. And get a notebook, whether you like to write things out on pen and paper, which is not a good idea for me because then I wouldn't be able to read it myself. Um, or um, I've always, even when I was in uh, high school... I used a computer, and when I got into college, I used a computer, and uh, I'll never forget the first Bible search software I bought was back in the 90s, and it really just, God just really opened up the, my joy in studying the Word of God, because, you know, I believe those words were there for a reason. God put these words in here for a reason. They were deliberate. And those words meant something. And if you will study, just take a word or a phrase in the Bible and study it all through the Bible. Find out what God said about that and how God used that. So I, uh, I took the word salvation, saved, saving, savior, just every form I could think of. And what, one of the things that's good about the Pure Bible Search software uh, that Donna incorporated into that is if you'll start typing the word out in the search bar, start with S A V, it'll then give you a list of every variant of that that is contained in the King James Bible. So if you want to just look for every version of the word salvation, S A L V, and then put an asterisk there, it'll give you every place that the Bible uses that word or variants of that word. Same thing with save or savior. And uh, then I got me a word document out and I just started, if I would, I would look at a verse, look at the context of it, uh, read around that verse, see what it says. And then put that in my word document and then I was able to then apply categories was able to separate out the scriptures into categories. Here's what the Bible says about salvation. How, you know, is, is it forever? Is it permanent? Is it this or that or the other? And um, it was, it took me a while to do that. But I can tell you it was time well spent. So instead of letting someone else tell me their view of it, which there's some good ideas out there and there's some really, really bad ideas out there. I'll give you the two extremes. The two extremes are, there's one, and Finnis Dake taught this, that you are saved when you repent, ask Jesus into your heart, forgive all your sins. You are saved at that moment, and you should never sin after that. And if you do, you have then lost your salvation. And you will die and go to hell. Unless, of course, you repent then you will get your salvation back. Now what that's called is repeated regeneration. And that is that far out there on that extreme. Which to me, that's no salvation. That is, that is still leaving it up to you and only you if you can keep up confessing your sins as fast as you can commit them. Then you might make it to heaven. And it's a, it's a, basically it's rolling dice on salvation. Did I sin today? I got to remember all my sins because if I don't confess them all, that's sort of like the Catholic version of salvation. You got to confess every sin, how many times you did it, 
And if you die between confessions, then you've got to go pay. You might go to hell. You might go to purgatory. Who knows where you go? Here's the other extreme. That you can feel guilty in a church service or with a preacher standing in front of you. You pray a sinner's prayer one time because he coerced you into it. And I knew some guys that did. Um, I know a guy that would basically go door to door and he would aggravate those people until he made them pray a prayer. They would pray a sinner's prayer just to get them off their front porch. And then he would tell them, you're saved. No matter what you do from here on out, no matter how your life turns out from here on out, no matter what you believe from here on out, no matter what you are from here to this day forward, you are saved and you cannot lose your salvation no matter what happens from here on out. To me, that is as, as, as far extreme that way as the other is this way. This one requires absolutely no participation on your part whatsoever. Which is fairly close to the Calvin idea. Okay? And the Bible doesn't teach that one either. So what does it teach? Galatians chapter 3, and I'll, I'll tell you what um, got me thinking about this this morning. I'm kind of going off my PowerPoint notes and going on to my, uh, my scripture notes here. Galatians 3, let's pick it up in um, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now we know that Abraham believed God in Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 15. Did Abraham keep believing in God in all the chapters after that? And the answer is yes. Did Abraham believe God when God told him to take his only son to Mount Moriah and offer him there? Did Abraham believe God then? Of course he did. Um, he believed God. He believed God um, even to the point of saying, even if I kill my son, I know that God will bring him back from the dead. That's belief. Because he knew what God told him. God said, out of Isaac shall thy seed be called. So he knew that Isaac was going to have to live long enough to bring forth a child in this earth. And since Isaac hadn't done it yet, he knew that God was going to have to bring Isaac back to life even if he killed him. So we know then that as Abraham's life progresses, he continues to believe in God. He never stops believing in God. So God accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing, verse 8, that God would justify the heathen through faith. That uh, We're the heathen, by the way. Through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. That was all the way back in Genesis 12. And these shall all the nations, or all the families of the earth, be blessed. Verse 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. So the blessing, and I've said this before, Blessing is the salvation word. When you are blessed, you are saved. If you're saved, you're blessed. Cursing is a non-salvation word. If you are cur you cannot be cursed and saved simultaneously. You cannot be cursed and blessed simultaneously. Your mouth cannot produce curses and you, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. Brethren, these things ought not be so. That's the book of James. So if you're cursed, you're going to hell. If you're blessed, you're going to heaven. Verse 10, for as many as are the works of the law, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written. And here's, here's what I was, uh, what got my attention this morning. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Now here's, here's what this is. This is the old covenant. And if you remember, your Bible has two contracts, two covenants, two agreements that God has made. The first contract or covenant agreement 
was with what God had made with Israel at Mount Sinai. It's very important to remember this. He made it with Israel and he made it at Mount Sinai and the conditions of that contract are, here are the 10 commandments. If you do them and do not break them, I will give you this land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are the conditions. And then he adds in here what you see in verse 10. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. A contract is of force, especially when one of the parties breaks the contract. If one of the parties of the contract violate the terms of the contract, then whatever penalties are in that contract must be enforced. The Constitution of the United States of America is not a document to be taken lightly. It is an agreement between the government of, this, of the people of this nation and the people of this nation. People who are citizens of Mexico and Canada do not have, nor are they under the same rights as those who are citizens of the United States of America. I watched the, um, whoever's in charge of immigration, um, I can't remember who that was, but he was testifying before Congress. And he had to, he had to give lessons to Democratic congressmen on the meaning of the law. And he had to remind them it is against the law to enter this country illegally. And he had to keep repeating himself to various members of Congress that he was testifying under. Those people are idiots. And I would remind them, they did not swear to protect and defend the people of this country or the Mexican people. They swore an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. Not the people of Mexico. They are not under the same laws as we are. In fact, their laws are more strict. If you want to illegally go into Mexico, you're going to find yourself in a Mexican prison for a long time. I do not ever want to go to a Mexican prison. Amen? If a person decides that they don't like this nation and they expatriate themselves to some other country, they forfeit their rights and the protections of those rights under the Constitution of the United States of America. They are no longer in an agreement with the government of this nation. And I say, be gone with them. This still is the greatest land with the greatest laws there is no other place in the world whose laws are as near perfect as the laws of this country. And you can blame the Bible for that because that's, who, that's what they were fashioned under. But it's the idea that if you agree, let's say, um, let's say Ron is renting a house and he signed a lease agreement, that's a contract, it involves two parties, the landlord and you the tenant, and there are laws that protect both the landlord and the tenant, and that contract is there for both of you, so that neither one, so that both of you are protected by the terms of that, he can't just go in the middle of the night and force you out of that house without abiding by what the law says. I've had people call and say, yeah, I'm fixing to be thrown out of my house. I need money. I need help with our rent. And I would ask them, do you have a um, eviction notice? No, the landlord said he was just throwing us out. You tell your landlord he can't just throw you out. Call the police. Because they can't just do that anymore. It has to be a judge signed off on the eviction. There are protections under the law. Amen. Okay, those are there to protect. So if Ron doesn't pay the rent, then he is in violation of the contract. 
And if he continues not to paying the rent, not if he's a little late, if he just flat doesn't pay the rent. And I'll, give, I'll say it like this. If, Ron's, if, the, if the landlord said pay $800 a month on the first of the month, and I give you five days after that, and if you don't pay the $800, I'm going to start eviction notice on you. After five days, if you've paid $750, he can go to the court and the judge can, if he wants to, sign an eviction notice. But you said it's, it's almost enough, but it's not the contract. And people don't understand this. That's the way the old covenant was. If God gave 10 commandments, he expected your obedience to all 10 commandments. If Ron pays $700 of the $800, has he fulfilled his term of the contract? No. And that's what people don't understand. They think that because $700 is more than the $100 I still owe, then I should be allowed to live in that house. And it doesn't work that way in the real world. Grow up, people. Amen? And it doesn't work that way with God. I kept nine of the Ten Commandments. Surely God is not going to hold me. Oh, yes, he is, because that was the old contract. That was the old covenant. And so that's what he said here in verse 10. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which were written in the book of the law to do them. How many things? All things. Not just part of it. I had a conversation with a man this week. You pray for him. Because he asked us to pray for him. He is coming out of something that somebody that we all know is going into. He is coming out of a Sabbath keeping church or a, they claim to be Sabbath keepers, but they're really not. But the idea is that they are keeping the Sabbath and they are the only ones who are keeping the Sabbath because they go to church on Saturday while nobody else does. And all you Sunday keepers, you're all going to hell. And see, isn't that, in, that, isn't that what Paul said in Ephesians 2? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I don't know of a single legalistic religion that does not boast about the things that they do over the people who do not do what they do. And I asked the man, I said, okay, we're just talking man to man here. I said, you ever lust after another woman? He said, yeah. I said, so what good does it do for you to, quote unquote, keep the Sabbath on the same day that you lusted after another woman? I said, what good, what good does it do? If a man offends the law in one point, he is guilty of all. If he doesn't pay $100 of his $800 rent, then he has broken the contract. He is guilty of violating the terms of the contract and will suffer the consequences of that because he did not continue in those things. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, that's the law. That's, and that's why we write them down. And that's why God wrote them down. That's why God did not just whisper them in Moses' ear and say, now Moses, now tell everybody what I said. Moses had it in his hand written by the finger of God itself. So there was no question. And it was written on both sides of the tablets in stone so that it could not be added to and it could not be taken away from. Very plain. And this is the way the new, this is the way the book is in God's right hand. Sealed with seven seals. It was written on both sides and sealed. So it could not be added to and it could not be taken away from. And man, ever since that day, has either tried to add to God's word or subtract from God's word. But the man called me this week and he's, he's wanting prayer. He said, I'm just, he said, I've been listening to you online. And he said, I'm, I'm convinced that that ain't right. Thinking that I have to go to church on Saturday in order to please God. I said, there is only one thing that satisfies the judicial requirements of God. And that was the sinless son of God, Jesus Christ himself and no other. In no other flesh is God pleased than in Jesus Christ. And if we find ourselves in Christ, 
then we are blessed with Christ. And I said, it's that simple. God made the law so that we would understand that we could not, by our own righteousness, ever make God happy. But some people get the idea that $700, Ron, is good enough for that greedy landlord. But it's not. That's not what you signed the agreement. If you didn't, if you didn't want to pay that rent, then don't move into that man's house. Amen? That whole housing thing when Obama became president. If you couldn't pay that mortgage, you shouldn't have moved into that house. Or is that just being mean? Well, the Democrats all said that's just being mean. No, that's the law. What are we now? Are we a nation that doesn't need laws anymore? I hope we never get to that. Amen. Now, now that I've said that, um, I want your Bibles open. I'm going to read verses. They're not going to be on the screen for you. And um, we're going to understand this new covenant, this new covenant that we have, even though it is not a covenant of do. Because what needed to be done has already been done. It was done by Christ. But it's a covenant nonetheless. It's an agreement between God and man. And instead of it requiring us to continue to do the works of the law, which is impossible, it requires us to believe what God said. It's a covenant of faith. The just shall live by faith. So, again, you have this extreme over here that says, every time you sin, you're going to hell. You've lost your salvation. You must get it back by repentance. And by the and here's what else he thrills into it. If when you confess the sin that you did the first time, if you go back and repeat that same sin, then God unforgives the previous sin that you did and throws it back on top of you. Just like the Mormons believe. So that's that extreme. The other extreme is, and I could name for you names of people who believe this. Uh, and I'll name this one because I, I don't care if you tell him or not. Stephen Anderson goes around telling everybody, pray this prayer. And you're guaranteed to go into heaven. He believes that you pray the sinner's prayer if you believe it only for that day alone. Then you can never lose your salvation. And my expression is you can become an atheist, lesbian, witch after that and still go to heaven according to him. And that is not scripture either. Because the continuance part is still part of it. Abraham continued to believe in what God said. Even though he was a liar. Because he lied uh, on two occasions about who Sarah was. Okay? Um, he believed what God said. So, does the new covenant that we're under require a continuance of faith? John 15, 9. And I'll give you about eight seconds. Turn to that passage. That's how long it takes for you to ride a bull, right? Eight seconds. John 15, 9. He said, as the Father hath loved me, so have I continue ye in my love. Continue. How about Acts 14? Most of, these, most of these are in order, so it would be a little bit easy on you. Acts 14. And yeah, I've had my days of not being so sure. Verse 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Look what it says in verse 22. 
confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to what? Continue in the faith. And that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Yes, we're going to be troubled. And that faith, as 1 Peter says, is going to be put on trial. And how many times already has it been? How many times has the devil tried to shake your faith? Try to get you to not believe what God said. Multiple times, right? But you, you're still here. And what that means is you still believe what God said. At the end of the day, you still believe what God said. So uh, that we, uh, exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Uh, Romans 11. Romans 11. Let's look at verse, oh yeah, look at verse 18, Romans 11 is about that tree, that olive tree, and Israel is the natural branch to that tree, but why was Israel's branch taken off of that tree? Unbelief. So, verse 17 and if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, because we're Gentiles, we're heathens, work graft in among them, and with them partake us of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You're not holding up Christianity. You're not holding up the faith. The faith is holding you up. Amen. Christ is holding you up. So verse 19, thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. That's pride. Don't ever think that. Don't ever replace Israel either. The Jews are still the Jews. Verse 20, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off and thou standest by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell. Severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. Think of it like this. What's the password to your computer? Who remembers? What's the password? Don't tell me what the password to your computer is. But if you turn your computer on and it sits there blinking, asking for your password, if you remember your password, you can get into your computer. But what happens if you don't remember your password. Gloria, what happens? You don't get in. So Gloria and my mom and I've convinced my wife, because I do it, I write them down somewhere. Because sure as the world, I'm going to forget them. Right? Okay, same thing. Same idea. If you, if you, don't, if you don't remember it, you don't get in. But he says here, Behold the goodness and severity of God, and them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And does God already know that? Of course he does. He's God. He already knows. He already knows who will make it and who will not make it. He already knows that. I've grown up in church. I've seen a lot of people come in. I've seen a lot of people come down to the altar. And I've seen them just shortly after that leave and never, ever, ever come back. And that threw me. Because I thought that they would stay forever. And they didn't. They're gone. And some of them stayed gone and died gone.
Okay? And God knew it. So it says, if thou continue in his goodness. If you put the password in, it'll let you in. Uh, turn to Colossians. Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And the, the point I, I would make with uh, Galatians 3.10 is the continuing in the Old Testament covenant. So let's say that when God gave them the commandments and they agreed to it, they agreed to it. Israel agreed to that covenant. They said, all that thou hast said, we will do. All that thou hast said, we will do. So on day one, they may have done it. But God doesn't say just on day one. He says, continue in this covenant. So day two, day three, day four comes along and now they're coveting again. Like they did before Moses came down. As of that, even though God had long suffering with them, and even though as a landlord, he may say to you, I'll give you another week to catch up. I won't kick you out now. Because it's better for him financially to long suffer with you if, even if you're slow at paying, you still pay it. It's better on him. But if you don't pay all of it this month, and then don't pay all of it next month, and then you keep jipping this man out of rent, eventually he's going to go to the judge and say, this is what they signed the contract, this is what they've paid me, I've got the receipts, I've kept the receipts, they're going to have to prove that they've paid me if they're going to lie to it, I lie about it, but I'm telling you, judge, that they don't pay their rent, and I'm tired of them and I want them out. The judge will say, take them out. Because you didn't continue in it. And God had continued, God had a lot of long suffering with Israel. In the Old Testament days, he let, them, he let them go. He let them sin. Even if they did sin, he had, a, he had a, the substitutionary atonement by way of the tabernacle. And those sins were rolled toward Calvary. But even that went away. And they just didn't do it. And God ended up writing them a bill of divorce. Uh, where did I tell you? Colossians 1. Um, look at verse 21. Colossians 1. Ye that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and, and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Verse 23 is the condition. If ye continue in the faith. You'll never see in the New Testament where it tells you to continue in your good works to stay saved. It will tell you continue in faith. And it will do it repeatedly. And I've got 1 Timothy 2.15. 1 Timothy 4.16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. 2 Timothy 3.14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of. 1 John 2.24. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And I've got probably a dozen more verses to say basically the same thing. Continue. Continue in the covenant. It's not that you believe. And I've had, I'm not kidding you. People who would say, I could take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven. You're tempting God because they've attached eternal security to their salvation. They make statements like that. I could take the mark of the beast. I could become an atheist homosexual. I could do whatever I want to. And I'm still going to heaven. That's not scripture. It's not what this is what I wanted to find out. If they were telling the truth or if they were lying and they were lying. Amen? Amen. So you're going to hear it from me. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. And don't let sin stop you either. Don't let sin stop. Don't let the devil tell you, oh, you blew it. You're not good. There's no way in the world you're going to heaven. Listen, I've heard that one before. And then I read the scripture. And let God be true and every devil a liar. Amen. 
Father, we love you. And Lord, I didn't, I didn't touch the half of what this book says. But Father, I thank you for the word that when I was weak, I could still believe what you said. I still believe, God, that you're a very loving, merciful God. And God, why you put up with us, why you long suffer with us, why even though, Father, after we're saved, we still bring you grief and heartache, and you still long suffer with us. That's why we still love you, and that's why we still serve you. Because you've done it for us first. Father, help us in our faith. Help us, Father, with times of unbelief. Long suffer with us, dear God. Many trials and temptations will come to test our faith. Like it did Abraham, like it did Job, like it did David and so many others. Father, we have these men as our guide and our counsel and our great cloud of witness to cheer us on, to tell us you can still trust what God said. Father, help us to never believe the lies of the devil, but believe you only. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.